1. Last year I took a class in the afternoon, which to be honest I hate doing, since school is an hour away on bus. That day I was walking to my bus stop when I get approached by a random person in his car. I tend to ignore and avoid people when I hear someone say hey on the street, because it's a waste of my time and I don't live in the safest area. But for whatever reason I just had to walk up to him, which was stupid. He then asked me if he could give me oral, to which I walked away and tried to ignore it. I have a partner in my class who made me laugh about the situation, so I didn't think too much of it. But today he must have spotted me and started to follow me, because he saw where I live and as soon as I opened the door, I noticed him and he tried talking to me. I didn't say much. He asked if I remember him and if I needed a job. I said no to both. Nothing much happened afterwards. I didn't write down his license plate, which was stupid. In case he tried talking to me again. I work as a butcher and carry knives to my work and back, so I'm not too worried about him trying anything. I really hope he doesn't continue bothering me when I get home from work, since it's tiring and I don't really have the energy to do much. But I'll try taking the bus when I get home from work late. I just want whoever is listening to avoid strangers on the street and be safe. 2. This happened when I was a senior at a large university, which is nested in a mid-sized US city. I'm sure my alums will figure out where. Note that students and other people in this city interact regularly and fairly seamlessly. I'm female, a bit above average height, and of a thinner though athletic build. I'm quite adept at taking care of myself, because I'm observant of my surroundings in any setting. I'm not a paranoid person, and I don't scare easily. But I feel that people with nefarious intentions often use the element of surprise to their advantage. This is an experience that opened my eyes further. One night after classes, some of my girlfriends and I decide to go for some drinks at a favourite local bar on campus. I remember it wasn't too late. However, it was late fall, so the sky had darkened already. A quick, relevant description of this pub is that it's basically a straight line back from the large front window, which looks onto the street. You walk in through the outer and inner doors, and there is a large bar where people can sit. The area by the front window where my friends and I were is usually reserved for larger groups, as it is slightly separated by a thigh-high wall. The restrooms are located at the very back of the bar. While sitting there and talking with my girls, I take a casual glance around and see a girl talking to a guy at the bar. I honestly can't tell you what caught my eye at first, but I would look at them every so often, even though the place was packed. I think it was because it seemed like they might be on a first date kind of situation. I'm a cerebral person fascinated with personality permutations so I naturally keyed in. The way he was looking at her was very intense. He wouldn't blink a lot, and though he was smiling, it was odd to me. After a while, I look up in time to see the girl say something to the guy, pat his shoulder, and walk off to the restroom. He stared after her sharply and shortly, as his hand began to grub around in a pocket I hadn't noticed his hand was in. He took another glance to the back of the bar and pulled something from his pocket. He looked around the bar, but apparently didn't see me looking at him, remember it was packed. When he decided no one was looking, he twisted something in his hands and hovered it over her beer on the bar. It was quick. Something was definitely falling like powder into the drink. It barely fizzled for a second, and then completely disappeared. You can imagine I thought I knew exactly what was going on. I sat for a second, trying to think of a plan. I had seen it, and I was shocked and scared. Who does that? What would someone like that do to someone who saw them? I leaned over and told my roommate Jay, and told her what I saw. I told her we need to go to the bathroom now and tell her before she comes back out here with this creep. And bless her, Jay knew I was serious straight away. She agreed, eyes wide and locked on the guy. We quietly hustled to the bathroom. The girl was washing her hands when we told her what was happening. And her eyes also grew wide as she told us that the guy had been asking her out for months. 
and she had finally said yes for the first time tonight. All three of us agreed that we needed to get her out of there ASAP, and without alerting this fool that we knew what was up. I told her we would go out and sit at our table again, and as soon as she saw us, we would all wave and yell each other's names as if we knew each other, and hadn't talked in a long time. Fake names, of course. We were young, not stupid. We do exactly that. She makes some excuse to him, and us girls walk out of the bar together. She's with us fully, in with the seven to eight chattering and vigilant circle, protected. The guy who was bigger than I even thought, about 6'3", and I'd guess 245-ish, when he stood up, followed us for quite a while. I knew he definitely had to have bad intentions, because in the approximately 25 minutes he followed us, he never just came up and said hi, he never stepped under any of the many streetlights. He slunk along behind us. We, my friends and I, could all feel the anger he was emanating. It was palpable. Eventually, after staying under the lighted pathways, friends peeling off and making certain he wasn't still there, we walked the girl home. And me and my roommate walked back to our spot safely. I think he must have thought she and or we were more trouble than whatever he had planned, and he eventually gave up. Years later, I'm certain now he wasn't a grad student. He was a much older creep in nice calculated clothes, hiding roofies. So guy lying about being a GSI and putting powder into girls' drinks. Stop it, you weirdo. And let's not meet. 3. I grew up a happy, introverted kid, but people my age seemed drawn to me. I've got good friends. When my parents divorced, I was 14. I became resentful towards my biological mother when I became aware of the full story. Since I kept all the pain to myself, I've become aloof. During those emotionally dark times, my parents brought us to the Middle East where they work. I came with my younger brother and aunt. It was a fresh start, a new environment. Then strange things started happening. It was an old apartment, but still looked good. My parents loved collecting antique stuff. My mom can see, feel and hear things that normal people don't. My younger brother started to sleep in the living room instead of his room. I was told that he can hear faint conversations near his wardrobe at the foot of his bed. The master bedroom is on the other side of the wall. Mom and aunt frequently get pinned down and choked by an unseen force. All of us accounted to be in the dining area. I felt a cold stroke from my neck down to my back when the aircon wasn't even on and I was sweating. One time I was left home alone. I kept seeing a shadow in the corner of my eye, while at the kitchen sink and the window in front of me. The odd thing was, me and my brother get sick most of the time, which is not normal for us. One time I was so sick that I fainted, like all the energy in me suddenly got drained. Mom was so worried that she tried bringing a healer. She was an old, stern-looking lady, but she was actually soft-spoken and kind. She told me to bring my hands together and took a look at it. She said that my pinkies are uneven. She said that I might be cursed by a witch. She also told us that in Feng Shui, the layout of the unit is not good. There was a bedroom window, the bedroom door, the kitchen door, and the kitchen window all aligned in a row. They concluded that it might be a portal. And guess what? That building was only a few blocks from a cemetery. The big thing was the antique items. There were African masks and figures, gnomes and others that I forgot. She said that anything with an image can be a house for spirits. She also said that I am the one carrying the heaviest load. I was emotionally negatively loaded. So she brought me to her apartment with my mom to cleanse me. Told me to physically clean my body first. The bathroom was like a sauna. I was there for like an hour while I didn't know what the two of them were doing. Then I was brought into her room. It was a strange sight that the mirrors were covered up, but there was a cabinet with a full mirror on its door, and that wasn't fully covered up. The woman told me to cry and pour out everything that I was carrying in my heart. She knew I kept everything to myself. It didn't happen instantly, but I eventually did what she told me. I was screaming and crying like hell. In the most intense moment, I glanced at that cabinet door that wasn't fully covered up. I saw a person's leg walk by it. 
The lady and my mom were sitting beside me praying. When I closed my eyes, I kept seeing a demonic image smiling at me. When everything calmed down, I was told of the reason why the mirrors were covered up. She said that they can be portals and I might draw something out of it. Our unit felt lighter when we removed all those items that the lady told us to dispose of. We didn't get sick anymore. The building was demolished after a few years, and since then, I've never seen any new buildings built in that lot. I've never experienced anything similar in my life again, as of now. 4. A little background. I am a male. I must have been 13 or 14 years old back then. I'm 30 now. It was summer holidays, two months school-free before starting at the new school, the ninth year last before beginning my education as a car mechanic. There was this bar, a place to hang out for teens called Pool Planet, where you could drink beer and smoke cigarettes. I know, too young for beer and cigarettes, but in there nobody gave a shit about that. Play pool, darts, flipper and so on. It was a place with only a few lights, very dimmed unless you wanted to play pool at a specific table. Then the barkeeper turned the lights on at that table until you had enough and went back to pay for the time you were playing. A short layout description. When you came into that bar, you were standing in a massive room full of maybe 10 to 15 pool tables. At each table were placed chairs and small tables to sit and place your drinks and ashtrays. Felt like you were entering a cave. Vis a vis the entrance at a distance of approximately 20 meters. The place is huge in my memory, but it was most likely not. The bar was in the right corner, straight ahead was a small entrance into a much darker room, which was not used except as a go through passage to the toilets at an immediate left turn after entering. The rest of the layout is not worth mentioning. I freaking love this place. Most people were somewhat cool and equally nice to each other, and at the same age as me, more or less. I already had my routine, going in, searching for the pool table the buddies chose that day, getting a beer from the bar and joining the friends. But one day somebody interrupted my routine. It was a guy whose family I assume emigrated from Yugoslavia. Taller and older than me, long hair bound together in a ponytail named Marley. I have to mention I was raised in that part of town, where more or less everyone had an immigrational background and I never had problems with people with different coloured skin. Neither am I a racist in any possible way, but this guy looked suspicious. You know, just that typical kind of guy you did not want to interact with by any means. But young me seems to attract people like him like a magnet. Maybe stood out for him immediately. So he made his way straight up to me, me sitting there drinking my beer and trying to avoid eye contact, and began to talk to me. He had a Yugoslavian accent. Hey you, what's your name? Me a little nervous, David, why? He replied, David, hmm. How old are you? I told him my age in the hopes that he would leave me alone very soon. Then he paused and said, want to join my gang? I was maybe 13 or 14, but even I found that ridiculous for him to say. But I was also afraid of him, so I asked, what gang? Then he began telling me he wants to be the leader of a big gang, making money, and if I wanted to join, I had to pay him 10,000 US dollars. Have to mention, we pay with euros here, and I have never seen a single US dollar in my life till today. And he said it would be easier for him with dollars than euros whatever he means by that. And he said that if I find other people who also wanted to be part and were willing to pay the same amount, I would get a percentage share for every new member. I said, a little frightened, that I don't know how to get $10,000 and that this would be impossible for me and I cannot join, even if I wanted to. But he would not let me go so easily. He made it clear to me that he absolutely wanted me to join his gang and that I have to buy a necklace from him. Maybe as a gang sign type of thing. Which he said is the original silver necklace from Tupac, the rapper. Which I knew was a lie, of course. He said that I could have it now, but I have to pay tomorrow. 50 euros. So 13 or 14 year old me didn't know where to get 50 bucks till tomorrow, but was also extremely afraid of this guy. 
got home and stole it from my mom in the hopes she wouldn't notice it. I know. Shitty move. But this guy definitely gave me the impression he would hurt my mother as well if I tried to involve her. And my father was not in my life at that period of time. Luckily, she never did notice the 50 bucks missing. At least, if she did, she never mentioned it to me. Next day, I came to Pool Planet again. He was already there, waiting on me, of course. I gave him the money, even though I hated that necklace and threw it away a year later without even wearing it once. And he began talking again about this gang thing. I was afraid to tell him that I'm not interested. I was afraid of his reaction. So I said I still don't know how to get that kind of money. And he should try to get other people to join with more money in their pockets. He seemed to grow angry at this. He went away from me, straight to a guy I knew by the name of Chris. I also knew that Chris, being a tall, mostly unwashed, and also a little stupid fat guy with piercings all over his face, was involved in rumbles and other crimes that I also did not want to have anything to do with. They went into the darkness of the back room I mentioned earlier, stayed there for a few minutes and then came back, Chris with a little smile on his face, looking and nodding at me like he would say, I'm a member now, you also should join. I then said to my new friend, Marley, that I have to go home, and I left. That was the last time I was ever seen at Pool Planet. The only thing I could do back then to avoid that guy, so I thought. I left Pool Planet, so I left my friends there, and I had no one else who I called a friend in that period of time. I isolated myself from everything outside my home, stayed at home for the rest of that summer, turned my cell phone off, afraid that he would somehow find out my number and would begin calling me. I was definitely not safe from this guy. I later found out about him, that at the time I was hiding at home, one day he pushed another guy to the ground and kicked him in the face with the heel of his cowboy shoes. You know the kind of boots with that star thing on the heels? A spur? Needless to say how I felt at that moment when I received this information. I was so afraid for almost half a year that he would find me. If not at home, then he would one day be waiting in front of my skull for sure. But after time, fear was more and more gone till I no longer thought about him. I heard later that the police somehow caught him doing something illegal, and that he went to jail, and later, that he went back to Yugoslavia. I know there may have been a lot of paranoia involved. Maybe he just forgot about me over a couple of days. But I never forgot about him. So Marley, let's never join your gang. 5. I was reading Rosemary Ellen Guiley's Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits and learned something interesting about my own culture. My grandmother was a second generation Norwegian and I was brought up with a heavy Norwegian background. As I was reading the book, I found out that it is very common in Norway for people to hear a guest arrive before they actually do arrive. They will hear their door open and a guest announce themselves and find that nobody is there. It doesn't frighten the hosts. It alerts them that someone will be arriving. What they have experienced is called a Vardurgid. This only happened once to my mother. She was out at our cabin and knew my brother Bruce was flying in from Los Angeles, but still had to drive up to northern Minnesota to get a cabin. Mom heard a car door slam and saw Bruce walking up the hill behind the cabin. She waited and waited for Bruce to come into the cabin, but he never did. Shortly after that, she received a phone call from him, telling her he had just gotten to Duluth and would be arriving in about an hour and a half. Then I called her to see if Bruce had arrived safely. I live in Oklahoma now. She told me that the strangest thing just happened and told me the above story. I said, Mom, you've just experienced a Vardurgid. I told her about the Scandinavian roots to the belief and she felt much better. I hear a lot of people who have written in to say they get freaked out when they hear the voice of someone they're expecting to arrive and they're not there yet. Relax. It's only a Vardurgid, and it's not going to hurt you. My dearest brother Bruce passed away on Christmas Day of 2016. My heart is still broken. On the day after his death, I called his phone and left a message saying, Bruce, I love you and I miss you. If there's any possible way you can get in touch with me, please try. I love you. 
From the age of 13, John Mellencamp has been one of my favourite recording artists. And Bruce knew this because I talked about his music all the time. When I stepped into the Tulsa airport, Jack and Diane was playing over the PA system. The song was right at the part where it says, Oh yeah, life goes on, long after the thrill of living is gone. I believe that was my Bruce reaching out to me. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and I can't talk right today, I don't know what my problem is. My mouth keeps doing weird things. But, also welcome to True Scary Subscriber Stories, episode 67 there, got out eventually. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to everybody who sent their stories in for use in this video. If you would like to send me a story, send it to kingofthecities at gmail.com. That's the address I use for all the YouTube-related correspondence and stuff. Uh, and uh, if you want to drop me a line, feel free to do that as well. Uh, I can't promise I will I'll respond right away, but I will respond. It's not that I'm lazy, it's just that I, things distract me and need my attention, and I'll, I'll get to it eventually. I promise I do get to it eventually. Oh, also, uh, update. I got my Vive on Monday. And oh my heavens, it is so much fun. I've only done a few things with it. I, um, I downloaded Stage 9's Enterprise D recreation, uh, and the VR versions, it's a little bit buggy, but still it's Enterprise D and you can walk around and pick things up in that. So I'll be looking forward to the version 10 when it comes out. Although I'll probably still play around in version 9 till even then, you know, so it's, it's a lot of fun that. Uh, but that's just a fan-made project. A lot of hard work goes into it, but it's not an official thing, it's a fan-made project. And uh, what else? Uh, like I, say, I haven't done a lot. I want to get some work done. Oh yeah, I, I tried out Google Earth in VR. That is so much fun. You, you're essentially just flying around above the cities. Uh, you, you can be like a giant, right? Or you, or you can set it so that it sets your, your, your mode to like a more realistic scale. So you're still flying around, but it feels more like you're your actual size. And, and and on that one, you when you're actual actual size, you can go down in to the things, and <laughs> it well it looks like literally what it is. Someone's tried to recreate the world, but they've done it from really low res pictures and tried to extra extrapolate from that. So you've got cars that are kind of melded into the roads and things like that. It's actually kind of cool looking, uh, and of course you can still do the street view where you it's basically just pictures you're looking right inside pictures. Uh, but anyway, it's a lot of fun, and I'm going to be looking forward to tinkering around and playing with it. Uh, there's a few games I've got my eye on, but I am Scottish, so that means I'd rather have a bargain than pay full price. So I'll be waiting. For, I'll be waiting till Steam does its next sale on these games because I know they will, because every one of them has been on sale recently. Actually, they were all on sale. They had a VR sale uh, over the weekend there. Uh, I just didn't want to buy any new games until I got my my system set up. And I'm I'm yammering, so I'm just gonna shut up and go away now. So until next time. Thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.